When we are talking about the solid flux, we are actually talking about energy transport in the soil. And soils are very complex things, as you see in the rightmost picture. They are extremely variable in the horizontal, but also, if you see the profile here, in the vertical. They are variable in terms of their uh, properties, uh, the amount of uh, organic matter, for instance, but also the contents of water uh, can be quite variable. And so we're looking at a complex part of our system in which we try to understand how energy transport is going to work. Well, you already looked at the introductory video and there we tackled the mathematics and we started with three differential equations and we saw that there are a number of soil thermal properties that are very important. So the basic equations are the same for every soil, but it are the soil thermal properties that determine how a soil actually responds to a certain forcing. We also saw that these thermal properties depend on the soil properties, and that is something that we're going to look into more detail in today. We also saw that you can solve the diffusion equation for a simple boundary condition. If you impose a sine wave at the surface, the result is that you get a sine wave of the temperature with a reduced amplitude and with a phase shift if you go deeper and deeper into the soil. And we also saw that the central parameter that comes out of that is what we call the damping depth. Well, this is the point where we start for today. What are we going to do in the first part of the lecture on the soil heat flux? We're going to have a look at the uh, soil thermal properties and which factors are determining those. We will also look briefly look at the effect of rain on heat transport in the soil and we will also try to understand how the heat transport in the soil is measured and what kind of corrections are needed for those measurements. If we try to understand the thermal properties of a soil, uh, we better start with the thermal properties of the soil material, so the matrix. Well, very roughly, you could say that the matrix can be composed of quartz minerals, clay minerals, and organic matter. So let's first have a look at the thermal properties of those individual types of soil material. Well, the first column shows density, which is uh, mainly the important to make the conversion between specific properties and volumetric properties and otherwise it's not really a thermal property but the th uh, let's have a look at the thermal properties themselves so we have the specific heat first then the thermal conductivity and related diffusivity what would be interesting is to see in what way they vary so if we have a look at the numbers we see that there's a very large uh, variation in the thermal conductivity and also in the diffusivity. So quartz is a quite good thermal conductor. Clay minerals are already uh, much less well able to uh, conduct heat and organic matter is really a very poor conductor. So it's really a difference of more than an order of magnitude in thermal con conductivity if you go from quartz to organic matter. For the specific heat it's a little bit the other way around but the difference is not as dramatic. So it's a factor of two difference between organic matter and quartz, but you see that organic matter has a higher specific heat capacity than the quartz and clay minerals. Well, apart from the matrix, another thing that is important in the soil is of course the water content. And so if we have a look at the uh, thermal properties of water and compare those to that of the soil matrix one thing stands out and that is the difference in specific heat so the specific heat of water is at least two uh, a factor of two larger than of that of organic matter and even a factor of five larger than that of uh, quartz so having water in your soil yes or no has a significant impact on the uh, specific heat on the other hand we also see that the thermal conductivity is much less it's a little bit of the order of the thermal conductivity or of organic matter. So having water in your soil is not really helpful in terms of conducting heat easily. And then finally, 
if you have water in the soil, you can also have air in the soil. So the pores are either filled with water or air. We looked at the thermal properties of water. If we look at the thermal properties of still air, then it's mainly the thermal conductivity that stands out. And really air is an insulator, and we already knew that, of course, but it really it's an order of magnitude uh, less well conducting than uh, water, for instance, and even than organic matter. So we now at least have seen the different parts of this table. We have had a look at the numbers, and now it's up to you to do an exercise with those. And the question is, we have a soil. It's a little bit of an idealized soil, with, but it's a soil with a porosity of 40%. So the matrix makes up 60% and the pores make up 40% of the volume. Well, the matrix only consists of quartz, so that makes it easy. But the pores are filled for three quarters with water and for one quarter with air. And now the question is, given those that information, which of the properties, the soil thermal properties, can be calculated with these data? And so we have the whole list. It's density, specific heat, volumetric heat, the conductivity, and the diffusivity. So which of those do you have sufficient information for to calculate them? And if the answer is yes, if you can calculate it, then the next question is give the value um, and calculate it based on the values that you see in this table, which is in fact a copy from table 2.2 in the book. Well, it's up to you and let's see how far you can get. Welcome back from your hard work. If all is well, your conclusion was that only the density of the soil, the specific heat capacity and the volume heat capacity can be computed if you know of which material the soil is composed. And actually that means that if you, even if you have a very nice soil sample, if you would just throw it in a bucket and measure the density and heat capacity again, that wouldn't change anything. Whereas for the conductivity and the diffusivity, you really should have an undisturbed soil sample because it is the arrangement of these particles and also the water and air uh, that's in the soil that makes up and determines the conductivity. So it's the arrangement in terms of how the different particles are connected to each other and what is the size of the conne connections between the different particles that mainly, or at least also determines the conductivity apart from the properties of the different materials in the soil. So with the data that I gave you, just the composition, the only things that you could compute is density, specific heat and volumetric heat. Well, then the question is, how are we going to go about that? Well, you should keep in mind that the only thing that I gave you is the volumetric fractions. And so we should start from, from those volumetric fractions. Well, the matrix consisted or, or constituted 60% of the total volume and the remaining 40%, the pores were filled partly with water and partly with air. And that gives you also the volumetric fraction for water to be 30% and for air, it is 10%. And of course, together, all of these volumetric fractions make up 100%, so one. Then we take the density and the volumetric heat capacity, we just take them from the table. So there's nothing new here. I just copied this value from the table 2.2 in the book. But now the question is how to go forward. Well, we use the volume fractions and we multiply those with the uh, properties of the different uh, parts of the soil to come up with the contribution of each of those to the total density, for instance. So we take the volumetric fraction of quartz, we uh, multiply that with the density of quartz, and then we get the contribution of the quartz to the total uh, mass per unit volume. Well, we do that for water and air as well. We sum that up, and then you end up with a density of 1.9 times 10 to the power of 3 kilograms per cubic meter. Well, for the heat capacity, we do exactly the same, but keep in mind that we can only apply this to the volumetric heat capacity. So that's what we did in the last column. 
And there you see that we end up also with a value for the volumetric heat capacity. Also note that it's mainly the quartz and the water that have an impact on the uh, volumetric heat capacity. The air hardly does anything. Okay, but I promised you that we could also compute the specific heat capacity. Well, if we know the volumetric heat capacity and we know the density of the soil, from those together we can compute also the specific heat capacity. So that's just a result of that. There would have been another route then, rather than going through the uh, volumetric uh, fractions, we could also first construct the mass fractions and then apply those mass fractions to the specific heat capacity. That would be another route which would give exactly the same answer. And then finally, if we would have a soil and uh, neglect the specific heat of air, and we also already saw that it is quite small, and if the soil is dry, in that case, the specific heat of the soil, so including the pores, is exactly equal to the specific heat of the matrix. So then it's only the matrix that determines the specific heat. Well, until now we focused on to what extent you can directly compute the soil thermal properties if you know the composition. Uh, but let's look in more general in to the way that the soil thermal properties depend on soil moisture. So we had a quick look for the specific heat and the volumetric heat, but let's extend that also to the conductivity and the diffusivity. We start with the volumetric heat capacity. In the graph here, you see how the volumetric heat capacity varies with the soil moisture content, which is given on the horizontal axis. There are a few things to note. First thing is that we have three lines, and those are for different types of soil material, so the material that makes up the soil matrix. And actually, the variation that you see here is completely consistent with what we saw in the table a few slides earlier. But apart from this variation, there's a much more important variation, and that is that the volumetric heat capacity has a very large change in value if we go from a dry soil to the left to a very wet soil to the right. So apparently, soil moisture dependence for volumetric heat capacity is quite important. Well, as we already noted earlier, conductivity is a more complex thing, and you might say that the total effect of conductivity is more than just the sum of the different parts. So we, we need to know more about how the material is arranged, etc. Well, the conductivity in short depends on the property of the material. And we saw in the table already that the conductivity is different for quartz material, for clay material, but also for water and for air. It depends on the arrangement of the soil particles, so the number of contact points and the size of the contact points, because in the end we already saw that the air in the soil is a, an insulator, so the only way uh, normally to uh, conduct heat is by going through the uh, contact points between the different particles. And of course the presence of water, because those influence the size of the contact interfaces. Well, let's see how that works. Let's start with a soil that's completely dry. So if we want to transport heat from the top to the bottom, there's probably a temperature gradient and the heat has to be transported through the soil particles, then through the contact points between the different soil particles downwards. And well, we see from the uh, conductivity of the materials that we do have here, quartz and air, that indeed the only viable route for the heat to go through is through the quartz, because the conductivity of the air is way, way smaller than that of quartz. But then we add water, and water has a conductivity that's somewhere in between quartz and air. And we see that the, air, the water uh, accumulates close to the contact points. So if you have a little bit of water, it will be located there. If you have more water, it will in the end fill the total uh, pores, but it will start close to the contact points. And that means that going from the left figure to the right figure, there is an instant increase in the uh, area of the contact points between the different particles. So that also has a direct effect on the uh, 
conductivity of the soil as a whole. And even though the conductivity of water by itself is rather small as compared to that of quartz, it's way larger than that of air. And so that helps. Well, what does that look like if we quantify this? Here we have a graph that shows the thermal conductivity as a function of soil moisture, going from a dry soil to the left to a wet soil to the right. And we see that adding a little bit of water to a dry soil, so the left part of the graph, makes a huge difference in terms of the conductivity, especially for the quartz soil. And if you go further to the right, we see that adding more water in the end still gives an increase in conductivity, but not as large as at the start on the left hand side. So there we see the effect that adding a little bit of water increases the uh, size of the contact points, but adding a lot of water does not really help because in the end the conductivity of water itself is not that large. The other thing that we see here is that in this case the thermal properties of the matrix have still a large effect. So the solid line is the quartz and the dashed dotted lines at the bottom is the organic matter. So here we see that the composition of the uh, solid matrix has a large effect and that is due to the fact that still the solid matrix is the major pathway for the heat uh, transport and water just helps a little bit. And the final step is to use the volumetric heat capacity and the conductivity to compute the diffusivity. In the end, the diffusivity is just the ratio of conductivity and the heat capacity. And then we see something special. Just in a similar way as for the conductivity, we see that to the left side of the figure uh, for the diffusivity, so that's the rightmost figure, we see that a adding a little bit of water to a dry soil has a, a significant effect on the diffusivity, up to a water content somewhere halfway. And then if you add more and more and more water, in the end, the diffusivity goes down. So there, the fact that the uh, conductivity only increases slightly, but the heat capacity still goes on increasing linearly, makes that there is apparently an optimum uh, value for the water content where the diffusivity is largest. And if you compare the different types of soils, we also see that that maximum is located at different soil moisture contents for the different types of soil. Until now, we have focused on the thermal properties of the soil. And in combination with the differential equations that we introduced earlier, with those thermal properties, we more or less understand how heat transport through the soil works and how temperature fields and the soil heat flux are connected. But at a certain moment, we also would like to go out in the field and actually measure the soil heat flux. Well, the instrument shown in the, in the picture here is a soil heat flux plate. And actually that's nothing else than a plate of a certain material about half a centimeter in thickness and say five to 10 centimeters in diameter. And it has a thermal pile installed. So with the thermal pile, we can measure the temperature difference between the top and the bottom of this heat flux plate. And as we also know the thermal conductivity of the plate, we can compute the heat flux through this solid heat flux plate. And if we install it in the soil, we bury it, we hope that the heat flux through the soil heat flux plate is actually equal to the heat flux through the soil. At least that is our assumption. Well, in reality, we have seen that the thermal properties of the soil can be quite variable. They depend on the composition of the matrix, but also very strongly on the amount of the soil moisture in the soil. So actually we are quite certain that the thermal properties of the soil heat flux plate will be different than that in the soil. But there's another issue, and that is that we usually bury the soil heat flux plate at some depth below the surface. So typically about two to five centimeters below the surface. The problem is that in the interpretation of the surface energy balance, we actually need the heat flux at the soil surface. But that is not where we measure it. We measure it at some depth. And between the soil surface and the solid flux plate, 
it's quite likely that there will be a divergence of the heat flux. So for instance, during daytime, the input of heat at the soil surface will be larger than that uh, heat flux at the location of the solid flux plate. And that expresses itself in terms of a storage of heat between the soil surface and the location of the solid flux plate. Well, for the difference in thermal properties and uh, of the solid flux plate and the soil, that is something we can correct for. If we know the uh, thermal properties of the soil and from the factory we know the thermal properties of the solid flux plate, that is something that we can reasonably well correct for. So what we will focus on here is the correction for the storage. And there are roughly two methods to do that. The first is the calorimetric method and we have the harmonic method. The calorimetric, calorimetric method is what we're going to look at in the next slide. And the harmonic method is something that is explained more in detail in the book. So let's look at the conceptual picture to the right. So we have installed this heat flux plate at a certain depth D below the surface. And so what we measure is the soil heat flux at the depth of the location of the soil heat flux plate. And so that is the heat flux at the depth D and the magnitude of that is G1. So the G for heat flux at uh, location one. But if we look at the temperature of the layer between the soil surface and the heat flux plate, Tg, that will uh, change if there is a difference between the solid flux at the surface, G0, and the heat flux at the location of the heat flux plate, G1. And the rate of change of the temperature is directly related to the difference between the heat fluxes at both uh, depth and inversely proportional to the depth of the plate and also inversely proportional to the volumetric heat capacity. So if we want to correct our observed heat flux, so if we want to use our observed heat flux G1 and from that compute the real heat flux at the surface, G0, we can just rewrite the above equation and then we get an expression that links the heat flux at the surface to the observed heat flux at depth D and the, right, uh, the rate of change of temperature. And so what we see here is that apart from measuring the soil heat flux at a certain depth, we also need to measure the soil temperature of the layer between the surface and the soil heat flux in order to be able to make this correction. Finally, I would like to give some attention to the situation where the soil moisture plays another role in heat transport. And so rather than sitting there passively and transporting heat by conduction, there's also a situation in which the moisture in the soil plays an active part in the sense that the heat is transported by convection, so by the motion of moisture through the soil. And that is the situation where we have rainfall and infiltration of that rainfall into the soil. And if the water, the rainwater has a different temperature than the soil, uh, then actually the input of rainfall also uh, reflects an input of heat or it prob most probably it could be a negative input of heat if the rain is cooler than the soil. And in this figure you see what could be the effect of rainfall on the surface temperature of the soil. So we have quite an intense rainfall event of about 20 meter, millimeters in an hour. And if we look at the soil temperature in the lower graph, we see that if we would not take into account the effect of input or removal of heat from the soil by the rainfall, we get the solid line. So there is a clear diurnal cycle and a decrease of the surface temperature uh, also at the moment of the rainfall. But if we do take into account the effect of convection of rainwater into the soil, we see a dramatic effect in the uh, dashed lines. And the difference between the two lines is up to about uh, one and a half degree. And of course, it depends a little bit on the, what temperature we assume about the uh, 
uh, rainfall, so whether the rainfall has a temperature equal to the air temperature or whether it's more like the wet bulb temperature, but still the effect is quite large. So that is another way in which soil moisture or the input of soil moisture can play a role in heat transport in the soil. Now it is time to summarize. We have quite extensively looked at the soil thermal properties. So we looked at the density, the specific heat capacity, the volumetric heat capacity, conductivity and diffusivity. And we have seen that the material of the matrix has a significant effect on most of those uh, properties, but also the porosity and importantly also the soil structure, in, especially for the conductivity and the, and the diffusivity. And the moisture content also plays an important role. So thermal properties of the soil are quite complex things. Then we had a quick look at the way we measure the soil heat flux and also how we need to take into account the flux divergence between the soil surface and the soil heat flux plate. And finally, we had a quick look at the way that the infiltration of rainwater can have an influence on the transport of heat in the soil.